Good evening. It's great to see everyone here. Thanks for coming out. My name is John Leopold. I'm a Santa Cruz County Supervisor. Uh, you're in the wonderful 1st District, and if you live in the 1st District, you'd be home by now. Uh, I'm also Chair of the Regional Transportation Commission. Um, and I'm very pleased that uh, this year we're trying to take some time as part of the Transportation Commission to uh, think big. Uh, so often in our uh, transportation uh, policy debates, we think about individual projects, but we don't think about the bigger picture of all of our transportation needs, all of our transit needs. So uh, this year, we've, uh, we've decided to hold an Innovators in Transportation Policy series. Um, and you probably got information when you came in. Uh, but this is our inaugural event uh, for this series. Um, uh, you'll be hearing more about Jared Walker in a moment. But we're doing public sessions as well as sessions with the Regional Transportation Commission uh, because we think this is a policy discussion that shouldn't just happen with those that, elect, that are uh, elected and on the uh, Regional Transportation Commission, but also with the community. Uh, because we're better when, we, when we're all working together and all have, are working from the same base of facts. Uh, so, so thank you for being here and thank you for taking time to think about transportation in our community. Uh, I'd like to introduce uh, George Dondero. George is the, currently the executive director of our Regional Transportation Commission. George has been with us uh, for 12 years. He has overseen a lot of work on, um, in, on the commission and in the community. Uh, and he was a main leader in the passage of Measure D back in 2016. Uh, he's, he's a very good transportation thinker. Uh, he's someone that the community relies on. And um, I'm happy to, to have him uh, leaving our Regional Transportation Commission at least through the end of the year, uh, when George will be retiring. Uh, but uh, please join me in welcoming George Dondero. <laughs>
Since 1991, he has led numerous major planning projects in cities and towns of all sizes across North America, Australia, and New Zealand. He's also the author of Human Transit, the book up on the screen, um, how clear thinking about public transit can enrich our communities and our lives. Um, <clears throat> he's president of Jarrett Walker and Associates, a consulting firm that provides advice and planning services in North America. Um, I, if you haven't looked at his website yet, yet and you're really interested um, in what he has to say tonight, I strongly encourage you to look at his website. Um, it's really lively and rich in content, um, and he's, he's got a blog, and he's, people comment. It's a very interactive uh, website. Um, and there's a video that I, I watched last week that uh, is one of the really interesting presentation called Planning Transit, Can We, Can we Live Without Prediction? Um, and if you've ever worked in planning transit, you know that the, the, the ridership projections are always the magic numbers, and I, maybe you'll talk about that tonight, Chair, a little bit. Um, but it's a great video, and it's, it's worth watching. Um, he grew up in Portland during the revolutionary 1970s, the era when Portland first made its decisive commitment to be a city for people rather than cars. Um, Jared has a unique resume and is the only transit planner I've met with a PhD in theater arts and humanities um, that was uh, earned at Stanford University. Um, he's passionately interested in an impractical number of fields. He is probably the only person with peer-reviewed publications in both the Journal of Transport Geography and Shakespeare Quarterly. <laughs> so please welcome Jared Walker. Thanks very much. Um, wonderful to have a chance to um, uh, to speak with you all this evening. Always eager to find an excuse to come down to such a beautiful place and envy all of the people who get to live here all the time. I live in a pretty beautiful place too, Portland, Oregon, but um, you have a lot going for you here and it's really exciting to have people out trying to figure out how to crack the next big challenge, which is certainly how to get a transportation system that not just works for you and serves your prosperity, but also, very importantly, reflects your values. Now, one of the ch I've been doing transit planning now for 25 years or so, and been in conversations about it. But one of the things that is so challenging about it is that people are, have so many different notions of what the question is, or what the goal is, or what the point is. And, um, you know, I'm always being told, well, you know, Transit has to be more like this to please these people, or it has to be more like that to, uh, to please those people. It has to set there are these equity requirements and civil rights requirements, all these things, and that's all great. But what's the thing we're trying to do? What's the actual point of the whole thing? It's remarkably hard often to get people onto a page about that. What are we doing when we do transportation? So what I think we're doing is freedom. And I don't mean that in a sort of general uh, warm, fuzzy sense. I mean that in a very specific, mathematical, geometrically describable sense. And I want to start with that. The wall around your life. There is a sense in which we are all in prison. In that the walls of our prison are the limits of where we could get to in a reasonable amount of time. There is that wall around all of our lives. Several concentric walls, really, okay? There's the sort of wall of where you could get to in half an hour, which is kind of where you can go buy groceries, or where you can go to lunch. And then there's the wall that's out sort of an hour or a little more, which is where you can work or where you can go to school, and then there are walls a little further out, you know, maybe an hour, an hour and a half, you know, where you can do something that you do once a week. But we're all aware of those walls. We're all aware of the concept of something being just too far away, therefore it being not something you can do. And I want you to notice, if we're going to talk about freedom, this is its opposite. The opposite is the presence of that wall and the sense of that wall being close in. And that beyond that wall, beyond that wall are places you can't go, which means things you can't do, jobs you can't hold, schools you can't go to, clubs and houses of worship you can't attend, people you will never meet in person, who knows, maybe even the person you will not marry because they were not close enough for you to meet in person. There is only so much of this that you can do online. 
Lately, we've been specializing in drawing a lot of maps of these walls and trying to help them be more visible and to help people think about it. So, for example, I'm, my firm's working right now on a redesign of the bus network in Dublin, Ireland. And so here's a typical example of the kind of thing we draw. We say, okay, um, imagine somebody at Dublin City University, and she's thinking, where can I go in 45 minutes? Notice I'm trying to make this a totally non-geeky question. If, if the question, where can I go in 45 minutes, is too geeky, let me try putting it this way. Where could I hold a job? Where could I, you know, think about something that you would only have the patience to do about 90 minutes a day of travel for? Whatever that thing is, this is the answer. You know, is it, is it in this range of where you can get to or not? If not, you can't do it, right? So there's what, there's what it is now, where she can get to in 45 minutes. The network we're proposing, it looks like that. And the network we're proposing, of course, does 750 other complicated things that people can quibble about individually. It moves this bus route from here over here, and it requires these people to transfer over there, and these people have to walk over here, and all these numbers change and everything else, and you know, the bus stop is over here instead of over there, so this business is angry and that business is not. But, and all of that noise that is most of what we hear when we put a transit plan out, or, or any sort of big plan out to the public, it's all great, it's all important, but none of it is about what we're doing. <laughs> and what we're trying to do is move the walls outward so that people have more opportunity in their lives, which is equivalent to saying that they are more free. And if you want to connect this to freedom in the sense that we talk about in the Declaration of Independence, or in the sense we talk about in American culture, I am simply talking about free, all of the aspects of freedom that require leaving home. There are aspects of freedom that you can exercise at home on the internet in your pajamas, but there are still certain things that only happen if you leave home. And as soon as you leave home, I'm talking, that's the kind of freedom I'm talking about. The freedom that, is, that involves the need, the, the need to go places. So, that, so the freedom that is at stake in transportation. And then I, because then I can say, okay, so Jane can get to 43% more jobs um, uh, if she lives there. If, if at the university, it means 68% more residents can get to there in that amount of time. But thinking about it from a resident standpoint, someone looking there can get to 43% more jobs. Now, if you're against these 750 other details that people are going to argue about, you're against this, right? You're actually advocating that someone have less freedom than they could have, so that you can have, you know, your favorite bus stop where you wanted or to not have your route changed or to not have to transfer over there or to not have to walk over here or whatever you're upset about at the micro scale. That, and the, the, that sort of feedback that constitutes about 95% of all the comments we get on a transit line. So I'm trying to get it to something that people care about and I've never met anybody who didn't care about freedom. So freedom, what is it? Why do we know it? It's the ability to do what you want. And it comes with two big exceptions. You're not free to limit the freedom of others. That's actually called tyranny. When you, when you claim the freedom to harm or, or, or limit the freedom of other people. Uh, and you're also not free to deny physical facts, right? It is not a limitation on your rights that you have to uh, eat and breathe and, and all those things. Uh, there are physical facts about reality that are just part of the context and you're not free to deny those. That may sound really obvious, but actually a whole lot of what we deal with all the time in transportation advocacy and the feedback we get on transportation is those two problems, right? Um, people wanting things that involve denying limiting freedom to others, and when called on that, tending to want to invent their own facts or somehow you know, cause the, change the factual basis in such a way that what the, the contradiction isn't so much of a contradiction. But that first principle, you know, that you're not free to limit the freedom of others is very important because it, it's cause, it is where the concept of freedom comes back and turns out to be the same thing as the concept of equity or justice. Because there is in fact no such thing as an unequal right to freedom. That's just a contradiction, right? It is part of the very essence of all of us being free that each other are free. And so this is where the concept of freedom is in tension with the cultural, our, our culture around competition and the human impulses around competition. Because competition in the sense that divides a group of people into winners and losers, of course, 
brings us right to the threshold of dividing the world into masters and slaves, at least for a moment or an emotional moment of some sense, right? Um, dividing the world into, into, into the more free and the less free. So, and so it's something we're always navigating with. Um, but in, in reality, we know that the freedom to dominate is a contradiction in terms and that we are always having to negotiate our impulse to compete with our desire for freedom and our desire for freedom that, uh, and a desire for our freedom to be respected. Okay, so transportation is just physical freedom. The process of transportation planning then, under this approach, would be called physical freedom planning, okay? It's the planning that, it is the process of securing our freedom, securing our liberties, if we want to use the exact words of the Declaration of Independence, securing our freedom to do anything that requires traveling faster than walking, and Paul is leaving home. So, then of course we talk about freedom planning, and somebody hears a contradiction in that. And I'll, I'll turn it up a little high, higher. Freedom prediction is a contradiction. Now, why is that a contradiction? Because if I can predict your behavior, you're not really free, are you? If I know that you're going to do what I think you're going to do. And this is what long-term transportation modeling and prediction is all about. Okay. So, 20 years in the future, uh, some consultant, not me, I don't do it, I refuse to do it, but lots of consultants, uh, any number of consultants will be hired to tell you to run something in a computer called a model and tell you what the ridership will be on this transit line 25 years in the future. Uh, what are they doing? They're doing everything they can and to, be, to get this prediction as right as they can, but fundamentally, they have to assume that a whole bunch of things are not going to change for this to even be possible. They have to assume a constant background so that they can even see the thing they're supposedly studying. And so one of the things that is not going to change is, is you know, one of the basic things they have to do is this. They have to make assumptions about how human beings will behave and what values will be manifested in their decisions and how they will make choices. And they have to make those, those assumptions about human beings 25 years from now. And you see the problem. The only data we have to ground those assumptions in is the behavior of human beings today which is to say, the parents of those people 25 years from now, right? <laughs> Thus, we come to the conclusion that one of the fundamental principles of transportation planning, one of the foundational assumptions that we cannot live without, is that when you're the same age as your parents are now, you will behave exactly as they do. Mm -hmm. And when I'm talking to a group of undergraduates, this just goes right down their spines. It's just very, <laughs> very, very <laughs> fundamentally not what we want to hear about ourselves. And that's absolutely right. <laughs> because we want to feel free. So if you're a ph uh, philosophers in the room will have detected the problem of determinism and free will, as philosophers talk about it, I'm talking about it in the political context, just to observe that there is a conflict between prediction and freedom. And you can also think about it in terms of the sort of fundamental hypocrisy of our notion about freedom, at least my notion about freedom, which is that I really like feeling free, but the fact that you could all do anything you want makes me a little nervous, and so I would like to be able to <laughs> predict what you can do a little bit. But I like the notion. And so that's the basis of the whole, of the whole endless conflict. But, it, when, when, what, but here's the thing. If you want to predict the future, predict the future of physical fact. Um, I did a paper recently, if you're interested, it's quite readable. It's in, you can find it in the Journal of Public Transportation online called To Predict with Confidence, Plan for Freedom. And what I was doing was going through everything we know about transportation and observing how much of it is actually not prediction, not generalizations about human behavior, but is actually math, geometry, physics, or very basic axiomatic biology. Stuff that we can really be sure will still be true 100 years from now. And looking at what we could know if we focused on that and what it would mean to plan for the future based only on the stuff we really know what we can predict, rather than trying to predict human behavior. That is exactly the same as creating the space for freedom in the future, rather than trying to create a space of feeling like I know what all these marionettes in my model are doing, because I predicted their behavior. So do cars always offer freedom? It depends on where you are. Um, a car maximizes where you can get to only if there aren't a lot of other cars in its way. And of course, even if you, even in that situation, if you're achieving freedom by getting in the way of other people, that's not really freedom at all. 
So as you can see right away from this picture, uh, trans uh, the geometry tells us that urban transportation is a different problem from rural transportation. Because in rural areas, car was worked fine. The problem of the city is the problem of the efficient use of space. And one of the challenges, of course, we also have in communities of about your scale here in this county is that not everybody agrees about whether they live in a city. <laughs> right? Some people are kind of okay with the fact that they live in a city, and some people aren't. And yet, you, here you are in the same space, and you have to decide whether it's a city. Right? And some of it is, and some of it isn't, but you sort of have to decide this because it changes everything about how you do transportation. What is a city? A city is lots of people living close together, which means a city is lots of people in not very much space, which means a city is people sharing space. See, uh, it, it, the, uh, the defining feature of the city is that space is scarce, and the space needs to be allocated then carefully and wisely and justly, and like any other scarce resource. So you've all seen this image of, you know, there's a there's 100 people, and there's how much space they would take if they were in cars, or if they were on a bus, or if they were on bicycles. And the point is, obviously, that, um, that the amount of space is the ultimate winning argument for the for transit and for the bicycle. The ability to move while taking not much space is the whole point. And this is geometry. This, is tr this would be true, you know, this will be true uh, and, and in anywhere in, in time and space at a situation of very high density. Technology then never changes geometry. I won't spend too much on the technology distractions, but just to observe that you can use the same image to point out that that's how much pe uh, space 100 people take if they're on a bus, that's how much space they take in private cars, that's how much space they take when they're in Uber, that's how much space they take once they're in driverless cars. <laughs> Except actually this one's a little worse because of a biological principle, a, biologi a very axiomatic biological principle called induced demand. Induced demand is probably the single transportation planning idea that every transportation planner understands, almost nobody else does, and that we are just constantly banging the table about. Induced demand is the simple biological principle that if you make a desirable thing easier, the organism will do it more. And that is why if we remove from driving the appalling hassle of driving, the appalling waste of time that, that, and, 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 and anxiety that actually piloting the car is, people will do it a lot more. So, you know, like a lot of good West Coast green folks, I love the forest. Portland's surrounded by forest. I love being out in it. I would love to have my own little cabin in the forest. I could afford a little cabin in the forest. The reason I don't have one is that it would be a horrible ordeal to get out there on a Friday and a horrible ordeal to get back on a Sunday night. So I don't. But if it were easy to work on my way out to my cabin and all the way back in my driverless car, I might buy that cabin in the forest, and so would everybody else, and we would chop down the forest, and there would just be cabins in that suburban sprawl. <laughs> and so that's, that's kind of what's at stake there. It's called induced demand, which is why I think that if we ever get to driverless technology, we will have to have a driverless bus. And that's in many ways an easier problem than a driverless car. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about all the technology distractions. That's another presentation. But if anyone happened to come from over the hill and wants to engage me on that stuff, you're welcome. So I want to talk a bit about how we create freedom in transit planning. Fundamentally, the recipe that makes those blobs as big as possible is the highest possible frequency, forming a connected network, thinking about all the lines and pieces together, not thinking about them in, in isolation, with reasonable speed and reliability, and we'll come back to that one. And also, Responding to certain facts about the land use pattern, responding to certain facts about the city in particular, focused on patterns that are dense and walkable and linear, and I'll come back to that. Frequency is the cubed value. Frequency does three different wonderful things independent of each other, which is why we often find a nonlinear payoff to it. Um, it's less time spent where you don't want to be. Now, uh, now 20 years ago, I just said, said less time spent waiting. Now it's more it's more complicated than that, right? Maybe the maybe the your bus maybe you have to to punch the time clock at 8 a.m. and your hourly bus gets there at 7:02 or 8:02, right? and so you'll wait 58 minutes of your destination. So I'm really talking about time that you spent not where you want, where you don't want to be, and that also clarifies that even though I now may have this cool app uh, in lots of places, I'm not sure Metro supports this yet. 
but lots of places where there's this cool app that will tell me where the bus is and when it's coming. It's, that's the, the app will tell me that the bus isn't coming for 40 minutes, but that's still 40 minutes that I'm going to be not where I want to be. So it's less time spending where you don't want to be. It's easier connections to reach more destinations quickly. It is the frequency that joins routes and makes them a network, because otherwise they just miss each other like, like two freeways crossing without an interchange. And it's better recovery from disruption. So we look at all day frequency as a pretty fundamental indicator of whether you have a transit system that is seriously competing in high demand places for a kind of diversity of, of, of trips. And here's what I find quickly plotting the system here. Red is your frequent network, service every 15 minutes or better all day. And as you see, the only red lines in your county are just going up the hill to the university. Uh, dark blue is every 30 all day. Um, I find it striking that this is, you know, this is your basic regional structure going out uh, all the way to Watsonville, but that actually your inner, um, your inner city, Santa Cruz, Capitola, and a lot of them are actually more like hourly, which is not very useful at all, especially over those kinds of short distances. So um, it's an in this, is a, this is striking to me, usually a, short, a closer in inner city system in a place this dense is more frequent than this. Uh, it's also to some extent surprising to me to see relatively high frequency heading for Scotts Valley, even heading up toward Felton. Um, so interesting mix. You look at Watsonville also, internal to Watsonville, mixture of frequencies, quite a big mixture of frequencies, but not, uh, not anywhere near what you would need. Think about that frequency, 15 minute frequency. That means a bus is going more or less whenever you need it. Right? That's the thing that basically says, okay, we're not, th this is not plan your life around the bus schedule. This is services available more or less when you need it. But everything that's blue here is plan your life around the bus schedule. So, so I want to, one of the things I want to leave you with very clearly is that, it, and this is not the fault of anybody at, at, at Santa Cruz Metro Transit who are doing what they can with what they have, but you do not have very much transit for a county your size. And the, the debate before you is not just the exciting debate about what your infrastructure should be, and you know what you should do with various pieces of infrastructure. You have a very real immediate debate about whether you want to begin providing competitive transit service over much of the city because we know that simply a higher level of service than this would be useful to a lot more people and would be and and would be having a lot more benefits. I think particularly on the Santa Cruz Watsonville corridor, but also internal to both Santa Cruz and Watsonville. Where does transit succeed? Now here's the thing. When we're, when we're trying to create liberty for the greatest number of people, we have to think in a mode way. Because transit isn't the right solution for everyone. There are other, uh, you know, those blobs I drew for where I could get you on transit, there's of course another blob for where you could get you by car, and another blob for where you could get you on a bike. And those are going to be different, and, and the logical mix of modes to use is going to be different in different places. Transit, if, if, if transit is to succeed in serving a lot of people, transit has to be allowed to focus. And where transit focuses on, if it wants to serve a lot of people, is density, walkability, and linearity. And again, I want you to notice, I explain these things geometrically. As soon, when, I say, when I say I'm giving you a geometric explanation, what I want to do is inoculate you against all future noisy, confusing statistics that someone may recite. Because geometry trumps statistics, right? <laughs> Somebody who did a social science study that discovered a new value of pi, we would understand that no, we're going to stick with the value of pi because there must be something wrong with that because that pi is not a social science fact. Right? It's a geometry fact. <laughs> That's what this is. There are two bus routes. They have the same cost to operate because they've got the same number of buses on them, but the one on the top is serving twice as many people. There are twice as many people around every bus stop. Twice the, twice the size of the market around every bus stop. Of course we are going to have twice the ridership. How could we not? And of course we do. That's why transit has to focus on density. Take all the emotion out of density about it. We're not having an argument about SBA 27. We're not having an argument about sort of what your community should be like. We're saying your transit is going to vary based on this. And if you tell your transit agency to pursue ridership, it's going to vary a lot based on this because that's how this works. There's your population density. Several things are really striking to me here. <clears throat> Watsonville's ex not only extremely dense, but has a lot of room to densify. I'm also struck by how many pockets of density in Santa Cruz Capitola 
are, are toward the south, closer to the ocean, where all the bus service is every hour, um, rather than up on SoCal Drive, which is the place that has people most of Job density, a little more concentrated as it always is, uh, much, more, uh, much more unevenly balanced towards Santa Cruz and away from Watsonville. So walkability is the next one. So, so if density is how many people are around every stop, walkability is whether those people can get to the stop. So it's the nature of the local street network and whether that creates barriers or opportunities to get to the stop directly. It also contains you know, all sorts of aspects of the street design. A very simple example, what happens when you put stops on opposite sides of a busy street at a place where it is not safe to cross that street? You've provided one-way service because you, you're going to leave from this stop, you're going to be brought back to that stop, but if you can't cross the street, those are not the same place. So that sort of thing. And so when I look, when I'm doing transit planning and I look at, you know, a giant expressway style street that has development smeared along it, but where you can't cross it, if I did, where you can only cross it every half mile, I'm going to say, well, just put, put a stop every half mile. That's the only place where, you, where it's safe to run. Um, but you see how that has an enormous impact on whether transit can be attractive. Linearity can transit run in straight lines that are useful to the through riders. Or do we, you know, so those are two ways to arrange exactly the same city. Those are the four same land uses. Everything is the same except for the configuration, right? And so that one on the top, I can run a single line that serves all four of those things and connects them to each other and that they perceive as direct paths between any two of them which means I have the fewest possible lines so I can run the greatest possible frequency so I get the biggest possible benefit, right? That's called the linearity benefit. On the other hand, when I have, you know, oh, let's say a major recreational center situated, oh, I don't know, a few hundred feet away from the road, which is itself kind of a cul-de-sac, kind of a long way from anywhere that a bus might stop, uh, or, you know, a swim center perhaps, or, um, <laughs> or, you know, the Walmart behind a quarter mile of parking, or, you know, the university up on its hilltop behind a huge buffer so that everything has to go. I mean, no particular university, I'm not thinking of any particular university. <laughs> um, and, you know, some university, and obviously, you know, your university is big enough and dominant enough that everybody drives up there anyway, but. It's not, but you know, but the same university in a different configuration, like UC Davis, for example, uh, where it's on the way to other things and it's in the town, you get a lot better outcomes. Davis, Berkeley, and so on. Um, so this is also one of those geometrically unavoidable things. So if you're going to have a conversation about transit, and I want to encourage you to have more of a conversation about transit, and to have a conversation not just about your big infrastructure question, but also about what you're going to do right now with transit, about whether the minimal transit system you have is really, is really what you should have given your values and priorities as a community. That's really the question. You need to think about this question. Transit has these two competing purposes. And if folks like, uh, um, if, if the folks at Santa Cruz Metro sometimes seem a little beaten down, it's often because people in, the, in those professions spend their life being told to turn right and left at the same time being told to do opposite things at the same time. And, and, and we have that problem in transit. It's called the ridership coverage trade-off. It works like this. So there's a fictional urban area where the dots are residents or jobs. So the dots close together mean higher density. And there's a couple streets that most of the dots are along. And then you know there's a lot of low density around it. And let's say I have 18 buses. And if somebody wants me to, to, to design a bus down the street, this is not how my career started. My career started going around to small towns and cities in California at 10, 20,000. Um, and I, they wanted me to come in and design a bus network. And I'd say, what's your goal? And they'd say, ridership, ridership, ridership. Okay. And so I would design that. Because if the goal were ridership, I, I, um, the payoff, I'll have a high payoff from frequency. And so what I will do is put all my resources into focusing frequency on density, right? into running the highest frequency <laughs> service where I have the highest density. It'll look like this. And so I draw that. And then they'll say, but you forgot Mrs. Jones, who lives in the lower right-hand corner of the map. And I would say, you didn't say you wanted, you didn't, you, your, your criteria did not mention Mrs. Jones. Your criteria said you wanted ridership. This is the maximum ridership system. Now I infer from your comment that you have a competing and opposite goal called coverage, which is to say, make sure everybody gets a little something. That's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. It's just the opposite of this goal. So 
you cannot tell your transit system to do ridership and coverage at the same time. If you're going to judge them on ridership, you have to tell them to run high ridership service, which looks like this. If you're going to judge them on coverage, as, is, as in, does Mrs. Jones, wherever she lives, has, has, have a bus route, then you have to have low ridership expectations because you're going to draw this. And what this means is that I've taken my 18 buses, I've spread them all over town, uh, I have 10 routes instead of two, I've spread my resource over all those route miles, and as a result, these buses come in 47 minutes, uh, or every 72 minutes. And because of that, not very many people use them because they're just not very useful because they're never coming when you need them, so ridership is really low. But Mrs. Jones, wherever she lives, has a bus going by her house. So Mrs. Jones having a bus going by her house and high ridership are opposite things. And, you have to, and that's one of the reasons why transit's hard but it's, and, and it's one of the things that I always have to, when I'm training elected officials, I'm always saying, hey, elected officials, okay, this is what you're for. Elected officials are for making these hard choices, like hard budgetary questions. And that's what this is. How much of this do you want? How much that? Normally what I'll do with a transit agency is I'll work them through to a decision that's like, spend X percent of our budget pursuing ridership and that percent of our budget pursuing coverage. And then I know what to do. Okay, I'll take that percent of the budget, do as much of that as I can do. But then I have this much of budget set aside to do a little bit of that. And we all know what we're doing, and we have a clear accounting of why this, these services are what they are, why those services are what they are, what you should expect from these services, what you'd expect from those services, and everyone can be clear for the first time. It just bypasses a whole lot of endless recriminations about you know, who's being treated through. The interesting thing about these two goals, too, is that there isn't like, it isn't easy, there isn't like a liberal and conservative answer to this question or anything like that. It's much more interesting. Um, the ridership goal is um, uh, when people, when, when successful businessmen come and tell me that transit ought to run more like a business, I'll say, okay, you mean you should get more customers at the same cost? Yeah, yeah, okay, great. Well, then we'll cut all the transit service to your district and your community. Um, because, of, because, yeah, thinking like a business, what a business does is chooses which markets it will enter, right? A, bus a business does not, McDonald's doesn't feel an obligation to put up a store where there aren't going to be enough customers. So, so it's thinking like a business, focusing where potential is highest, supporting dense and walkable development. Urban redevelopment naturally goes well with this because it's going to focus on it anyway for its own reasons. And all of the green benefits of transit, all of the, the environmental benefits of transit arise from transit being ridden rather than from transit existing. And that's really important because I, I'm constantly hearing somebody's request for an empty bus to drive once an hour down her cul-de-sac being described as an environmental imperative, and it is not. It is only, we're only meeting environmental goals if we're putting buses in places where lots of people use it. But the coverage goal has all of its own great, great history and its great purposes. Who can be against access for all? I got into this too because I kept discovering municipal policies and, and regional transportation policies that said, think, that said, compete effectively through access for all. Right? Compete effectively with the car by providing access for all. You basically like you're yelling at your taxi driver, turn right, turn left, turn right, turn left, turn right, turn left. And, and he's not able to do that. So everybody gets frustrated. So this, is, this was my way of working, of trying to get around that. Um, coverage goal is, of course, the only goal that causes you to put service into suburban low, low density development, but it's also lifeline access for everyone. If you think transit, the transit agency is the social service provider that makes sure nobody's is stranded, then yeah, then you give them that task and they run lots of very low ridership service for a non-ridership reason. And finally, of course, service to every neighborhood. Political equity, political geography plays out here. You know, what's in my council district, what's in my supervisorial district, what's in my municipality, also causes that sort of design. We just, by the way, went through this process in Santa Clara County. And anyone who's interested in this process can, can look up the re reports that we wrote about it. We took them through the whole process. Different alternatives for what the whole network might look like depending on what your goals are. Just two more things I want to talk about. Quickly, the diversity challenge. One of the other big challenges we have in transit is that, of course, many of us get together with people like us and talk about what would be good for people like us. And that causes us to start to advocate certain things that are specialized around our particular tastes or needs. And so one of the things I always have to say is, Transit thrives on diversity, and high ridership transit has a diverse ridership. And what that means, too, 
is that no particular is that a successful transit system for the whole city will not look, look like what any one interest group would draw for itself. It's always it's always more more uh, you know it's always less specialized, more strategically designed to be useful for lots of people for lots of purposes. And this thing comes up a lot too. And it's interesting to me how often social, societal prejudices get dressed up as technical language. And this is an interesting example. We're often told, I'm often told that transit riders can be divided into two categories. And that one of them is the so-called choice rider, for which we are to imagine, um, well, I'll tell you the story. I was once presenting a transit plan to a, uh, that I've done to a, a, the board of a transit agency in suburban Southern California. And a board member who was a city councilor from the wealthiest city in the area said, <clears throat> now, Mr. Walker, if we adopt this plan, of course, would that make me leave my BMW in the driveway? <laughs> to which I thought, of course, well, no. If you have a BMW, and if your feelings about your BMW are such that you needed us all to know that, <laughs> then, you're going to, <laughs> then you're going to drive your BMW. But you know what? There aren't very many of you. You're a millionaire, if not a billionaire. Congratulations, I'm sure you worked hard for it. You're in the top 10%, but that means you're a minority. That means it is foolish to design a transportation system for everyone around the tastes of such a small minority as you are, sir. Um, the image of the choice rider, though, is generally this person who has a car, likes his car, but we're supposed to make this person leave their car in their car. And then opposite to this, we have this stereotype of the dependent or captive brain. And you know, you go down the street and you th and, and you'll often think you know who these people are. You'll see the people who are dressed for a cap for a factory job waiting at a bus stop, and you're like, okay, they're dependent. Has to use transit no matter how bad it is. I think the word captive is especially funny. You know, that actually we transportation planners, off in our own geeky space when we think no one is else listening, we talk about some of our writers as captives. <coughs> captive like we had them in the dungeon, you know. The reality is that nobody is totally captive and nobody is total, and practically nobody is totally choice, practically nobody is totally dependent. Everything interesting happens in the middle. Everything interesting happens because people are, have a car but don't really like driving, have a car but don't really want to trust it, have a car but, you know, whatever. Or don't have a car but have a bunch of options. Don't have a car and use Uber a lot of the time and Uber, Uber is getting expensive and would like something, you know, better options so they didn't have to use Uber so much. There are all kinds of ways to be in the middle and most of us are in some sense in the middle on this spectrum. And that's why incremental improvement is so important. That's why it's not just about the big spectacular project that transforms everything like a BART extension. It's about fixing your bus network. And it's about making the bus system incrementally more useful so that more and more people find it to be expanding their liberty in a way that makes it a logical choice. OK, so all that was very general. Um, I, uh, unlike most of the presentations I give, I was warned that in this particular community, there is a certain amount of um, anxiety around a uh, east-west rail corridor. And um, a number, of, and how it ties to a bunch of other issues for east-west transportation. It made me think of Jonathan Swift's novel, uh, satirical novel <coughs> Gulliver's, *Gulliver's Travels*, which is about uh, an explorer who finds himself in a country, uh, visiting a country where absolutely everyone in this country is completely polarized over the question of whether you should break your boiled eggs starting at the big end or the little end. <laughs> And they've come to blows on this, and they're having a civil war, but the only thing both sides are, can agree on is that this man who's not interested in their debate is clearly the enemy of what they should gang up on. So I thought about that. Well, <laughs> that there's this kind of polarizing question. <laughs> so I want to see if I can just talk around it a little bit in a constructive way. You have a massive, massive choke point problem. This is a geometric fact about your county. It's in the geography. It's not about anyone's attitude. What is a choke point? A choke point is a place where very high travel demand must fit through a very narrow space, like a bridge or a mountain pass. The Bay Bridge is a choke point. Highway 17 to San Jose is a choke point. Choke points create a problem of sharing space, even if density isn't that high. In other words, we encounter those problems, the traffic congestion, or whatever it is, or the need to fit multiple things through a space. 
even if it's not a particularly urban place in itself, just because such a huge number of places are connected only by going to bed. So you have the mother of all choke points in this county. In the big picture of this county's future economic geography, I could say in broad terms that it's like this. Here are a lot of people seeking opportunity. Here's a lot of opportunity. So especially if we're going to talk about the future in equity terms and in terms of freedom as being something that is inclusively provided instead of gained by some of the expense of others, we have to talk about the larger economic balance of the county and the fact that you have this structural imbalance in terms of where the predominance of people, where there are relatively more people seeking opportunity and whether there are relatively more opportunities, whether it's jobs or education or everything else. And in between it, if you wanted to make this a scary film, you'd call it the Act of Strangler. Um, one two-lane road, one four-lane freeway, and one rail line and or path, all in that little space in that. And oh, by the way, in the middle of this incredibly constrained situation, some people are trying to have a community and a business district and a bunch of other things, all in that little tight, constrained space. That's everything, right? So Kel Drive, the freeway, there's the rail line, that's all there is. There's no other way between the two parts of your town. So in that geography, a city, this is a problem of sharing space. And we know that the bus, the transit in general and the bicycle are both, and other bicycle-like things like scooters or whatever, but basically things that accelerate your body without taking much more space than your body, um, are both brilliantly efficient users of space, and that they both have to be accommodated as part of this story, and that it still has to hold fit through there. So, after thinking about this for a long time, this is what I'm prepared to say about this, and I hope it's useful to you. If it's not, forget about it. When you're going to share a space, you, everyone who's going to share has to get, has to sort of sit down and figure out what everyone needs and start to think about how it might all fit. And the way that works well is when people get at the table and figure that out. The way it doesn't work is when one group gets a bunch of energy behind it and goes out and wants to go ahead and do something and, and claim a certain space before other key things that need to fit through that space have been figured out. And that, I think, is the concern I'm having with the idea of moving forward rapidly on making a decision about the rail line before we have a clear picture about what transit looks like with that. And I've looked at your documents, and I have not seen that clear picture. I have looked at the options, and you know they're pretty terrifying. I know what Sokol Drive looks like. We're talking about a two-lane road. And, um, and you can say we'll have bus rapid transit on Sokol Drive, but we're talking about a two-lane road and bridges and culverts and all sorts of narrow spots and hills and dales. And, um, or we're talking about widening the freeway, or we're talking about after the revolution that, uh, that completely destroys the highway capacity manual, you know, um, someone says, okay, there's only going to be one lane of, of car traffic on the freeway. That would also be a solution, right? But it's, it, they're all that sort of thing at that scale. They're all really hard. So, in this situation, and I just I can think of very few places that have such an incredibly tight geometry, geography problem as this. This is the mother of all choke points. Um, and you can think, and you, know, you think about something like the Bay Bridge and the Transbay problem, and you realize how, you know, we struggled for years with the fact that this incredibly precious space had already been allocated 100% to cars. You couldn't even you couldn't ride a bike over the bridge, you know, before we had BART. And you know, there was that period after the key line was torn out, but before BART was built, where it was just cars and buses stuck in traffic, and this wasn't working. And you, the next, this, this, the several subsequent you know, decades of history now have been about gradually evolving a fairer use of this incredibly limited space. And yes, they dug, they dug a tunnel, just as you can dig a tunnel on the Raptors if you want, but that was really expensive. You're not that big, you don't want to be that big you probably have to solve it on the surface. But it's the same thing. It was, a, it was a long process of actually figuring how it all works and understanding that it has to work for everyone before it works. It has to work for transit. It has to work for bicycles and pets. And it has to make driving at least possible 
and it has to be possible to still have a community and a business district. So that's the problem. And often, I have to end at the point of saying, look, I can't tell you the answer, but I can, I can point you toward the sort of beautiful, simple, geometric perfection of the problem, which is simple enough when you look at it this way, that uh, you're going to have a revolution somewhere, somehow in order to break through this. I mean, there's going, you know, someone's going to go way out of their comfort zone. And in my experience, and a lot of this is my experience now of having watched Portland evolve and how Portland is functioning now, and what in a lot of it is it. A good solution is one where transit and bike pit, because they are capable of using space efficiently, they have enough space to succeed. Driving is also possible, but not necessarily in and as I get around Portland by various modes, and I frequently take the bus, I frequently ride my bike, and I frequently ride, one of the things I can observe is that, that, is that all of those modes getting around our city are about 25% cross country. And so none of them is 100% frustrating, and none of them is 100% clean and easy. And I finally realized that means we've got it right. That means we're sharing. Right? That means we're actually sharing space that we're all about 25% frustrated. And again, also we're not tribes, because people like me are all the different roads at various times. And we experience that as different kinds of frustration, but it's all balanced. And, so, and, and the other thing I can tell you about this is that I have been through lots of disasters. Um, real, awful transit situations, where I have been hired to come and solve a transit problem after the bike people have come and taken their space and the car people have come and taken their space. And the, um, the public space people have come and taken their space. Oh, we're going to close this nice street and make a plaza. And now, we all did this, and now do a transit plan. <laughs> all the time, I am hired to do that. And sometimes the answer is, there's no space left, you took from So, so that's what I feel about this one. That if you and that if someone who is going to advocate ultimately the use of the rail line for the active modes, removing the rail line, has to be an advocate for the transit solution that makes that possible. Because only the existence of a transit solution makes that possible. In an in the right kind of process where we are really sharing. So it comes back to that question, doesn't it? Can you expand your freedom without limiting the freedom of others? Everyone loves the drives. Of bikes of the bike path and the pet path next to each other on that right away. It's beautiful, it's wonderful, it would be fantastic. Who's left out of that? Is who is anyone's freedom being reduced by expanding people's freedom in this way? Well, that's why you have to pause and have that complete conversation. Thanks. <laughs>
I've done the best I can to balance equity, you know, coverage with uh, ridership. So how do they make an improvement within the budget that's constrained right now? Because the biggest, the biggest cost is the drivers. Right. And if, so if they add frequency, the cost becomes prohibitive. They have to cut something. So I want to be clear, there, there, there's a, there are several different transit questions here, and we have to have them all visible. Uh, Santa Cruz Metro Transit has only so much money. They're doing what they can with what they have. It looks like not very much because they don't have very much. Um, they're also operating on at least a de facto assumption about the ridership coverage trade-off, which is we have to have some amount of coverage everywhere. We have to go up into every squiggle on the mountains. And so, one of the things you could do, which is very, very politically difficult, but I've taken a lot of elected boards through it, is do a process where you actually think about the ridership coverage straight off and think about whether you want to turn the knob within the existing budget. And whether you want to have people who currently ride buses with three people on them and their families and their Facebook friends and their, all of their personal networks down in the boardroom screaming at the board because you take their bus out so that you can put it on SoCal Drive where it will carry 20 people. That's why I don't tell you that you should do that. I just say, yes, you could do that, and this would be the consequence, and yes, it would be the high ridership thing to do, and it would be the high screening thing to do. And, and the elected officials, it's their, job to, to, it's their job to take it from there, you know, figure out what they want to do. It's a budgeting question. Uh, budgeting is always about choosing between things that you like. So that's one thing. Um, I don't know, but you might end up where you are. But I also say, you just don't have very much transit service. For a city of, for, for communities of your size and your density, let alone the degree of progressive values that operate in this community, you don't have very much transit. And, and I'm just talking about the plain old ordinary bus system, which is where you start expanding people's liberty. And it's also where you start changing people's reality in the middle of the choice capture spectrum where most people actually are. You know, where you make transit, you know, make a trip. 10% faster or more reliable in such a way that now it becomes logical for someone to use it more or less. That's just in the funding of the ordinary bus system. And so, I, one of the things I would, I, um, and I, I talked to a couple of people uh, here, here casually, and I was starting to go, okay, everybody's very focused on this capital program issue, right? But that's, that's what the MPO deals with, that, and that, that's, that's what the RTC deals with. But there's also just a basic question of just how much transit do you want? How much of a bus system do you want? Because you clearly have far less than you could use. You clearly have low-hanging fruit of more markets you could compete for with a more effective bus system. I can see that. Sure. So how does the funding for the metro here compare with funding elsewhere? Um, I haven't gotten into the details of the funding. What I can say is, I mean, I can look at the, but I can look at the frequency map and say, um, look, that's, that's not very much for a city of this size and this density. Um, and, um, and, and so then, you know, there are lots of ways to do funding, you know. I think you're pretty much tapped out on sales taxes, and also we're getting more and more revolts against sales taxes because they're so regressive, right? We aren't getting low income people to vote them anymore. Um, you've got parcel tax, op tax options. There are options once you decide to have the conversation about this. One of the interesting things that happens is that often I will be hired to run a no growth network redesign study. Don't add any, don't add any more money, do more of what we have. And so, this actually sort of just happens at Larkenny. And so, we design these absolutely no growth alternatives. Here's a more ridership the alternative, there's a more coverage alternative, okay? Oh, ridership alternative, look at those high frequency lines and high density places. Cool. Coverage alternative, oh, good, we've got a bus for, you know, even for my grandmother who lives in the hills. Great. But I have to choose between them? Yeah. You said no growth, so yeah. Well, often it turns out that when growing the budget is the solution to the elected official's political problem, <laughs> which is having to choose between these things, having to choose between, you know, you know, either we can have a great 
you know, even, either we can have a great bus system in the city, you know, or we can take care of my grandmother in the hills. <coughs> Sometimes it turns out that finding more money actually becomes more urgent. Once we, once we are clear what problem we are solving, once, and it starts by being clear that, you know, if you have a problem with your transit system, I mean, I, I'm not to say, but generally speaking, if you have a, a problem with the overall nature of your transit system, first of all, you shouldn't be assuming that that's what transit is. It's just what you've chosen to invest in. And you also shouldn't assume that the empty buses are evidence of, 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 of <coughs> Metro failing to deliver ridership because many of the empty buses aren't trying to deliver ridership, they're coverage services. Um, you, should, you should kick the tires on it and turn the dials and understand there are some choices there and you could choose to look at that more closely as a community and make other choices. Ma'am. Yeah, thank you for uh, the RTC bringing you here. Uh, this really helped me get rid of a lot of the noise I hear politically and focus in on, um, like you say, geometry. Um, what do you have to say about one of the main problems I see? I'm retired now, but I used to drive what we call over the hill. Uh, I went from riding my bicycle to work for my second pension. I then went to driving 70 miles round trip. What can we do that makes sense money-wise and ridership, knowing that ultimately we're going to have to figure something, a connection on how people get over the hill where the big bucks are right. and where the consistent jobs are? Do you have any comment on that? Well, um, I, I, mean, I think that a good county transit plan process would include a conversation about the hill. Because although you obviously have an agreement with Santa Clara County about your Highway 17 bus services, it's one of those asymmetrical agreements because you all care more about getting to San Jose than they care about getting to Santa Clara is kind of the problem. Thing. So ultimately, this has to be, Highway 17 has to be part of your conversation about your own transit program. You can run a lot more frequency on Highway 17. Um, I don't know what you can do. I mean, again, it's 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 a it's a perfect choke point. Um, you know, I, I can't imagine any but a fantastically expensive interest rate that would you know get you out of that traffic, unless again we just agreed to take the highway down to one traffic lane. But um, um, but I certainly think it's a thing to have a broader conversation about it to understand really too that that's really part of your transit system. You know, it's 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 being run mostly for its benefits to you, and it's something that you know you get to you as a community get to make choices about um, about you know what you want to invest in. Yeah. Uh, thank you, and I really got your point about efficient use of space, and then in the analyses that your firm does, it's like a driving factor. And actually, I think there are a lot of people in this county who haven't seen those photos you showed of the different demand on space and different modes of travel. I'm wondering. What degree do you put in another consideration of efficient use of energy, understanding that a rail, something on a you know, rail car with 100 people in it has a lot less energy demand than the other end of the spectrum, an individual passenger vehicle weighing less than much and carrying one individual person. And then projecting forward, we're talking about physics is kind of inviolable. Well, we're headed towards a climate crisis, probably society at some point, deciding to put a price on carbon. So what about that efficient use of energy? Um, yeah, I, I agree. There's a, there's a whole conversation about the physics of energy and the physics of emissions, and really energy and emissions that go together in so many ways, too. Um, and it's, it's in such an area of technological permit. And I'll tell you that I'm not an expert in that stuff. I know there's physics to know there. I know this stuff. But um, when I read about that stuff, what I most want to find are people who will help me separate the physics from the technology, right? The physics from the marketing and the boosterism and the, and, and the visioning and all that stuff that is ultimately trying to get somebody to invest in something and that therefore muddies the waters about just what's the physical reality. And I think the reason you hear me talking about geometry in, in this world and talking about space in this world is that I find it to be, a, a, is that I got all you all, I got all of you over the line to understand the geometry of physical space much faster than I could get you all over the line to understand the physics of energy. 
So to some extent, I was probably just doing what's easy. <laughs> because ultimately, it is about convening people in the presence of reality and bringing reality, a shared reality, back into the conversation. But I completely agree. You can talk about this in terms of. A question on the cover versus writership. Can Santa Cruz County locally make that decision, mm -hmm. or are some of it driven by federal dollars coming in? There are some, um, and you know, Bear Iverson, who's hiding in the back, could probably answer, can go into the details if you want. Uh, there are some federal funding sources that do key off of ridership and thus push you a little bit in a particular direction, but most of it doesn't. Most of it is yours to spend as you like. And, you know, uh, so I, I think you should, you should move forward on the assumption that it is, it is within this county's power to decide where to go. Um, uh, Ma'am. A yeah, very quick question. Um, when you use the term choke point, mm -hmm. is that the same as bottleneck? Yeah, bottleneck, choke point, strangler, whatever metaphor. <laughs> <laughs> it's this. Okay, you have to strangle. Um, um, uh, sorry, sorry, I have a lot of hands. Okay. All right. Um, thinking towards uh, funding sources for increased frequency. Uh, uh, are there any communities that you're aware of that? might be in some way considered comparable to Santa Cruz County, where you have uh, opportunity seekers, as you term them, in, in one area, and then you have the area of opportunity of having those who offer the opportunity. I'm thinking the employers and perhaps the large educational institution uh, actually uh, be assessed uh, a certain fee to up the frequency. I'm just looking for money here. Totally. Uh, and of course, you have, you know, we have, you know, the great, the, the useful edifice of commuter production law in California. Many places don't. Um, although you don't have many employers who are large enough to be brought in under that, the spirit of that law is that employer, you made a location choice that had certain consequences for people and had certain consequences for the community and its infrastructure spending. Maybe you should help out with the consequences of that's the that's the moral argument, right. um, and just in terms of the divert, just to make clear that I'm not particularly showing for Santa Cruz Metro, I'll mention Davis. You know, there are all kinds of ways you can do this, and one of them is you can let the university run the bus system and have undergraduates drive the bus. So there are all kinds of options. They have a lot more transit than you. Um, they don't have very many accidents actually, um, but um, you know, different situation. But there are all kinds of things being tried. Um, and you know, including you know, we have you know, we have situations now where some universities are so completely integrated with their transit system. You know, the huge university in a small town, where the where the university is you know driving 70, 80 percent of the transit system's ridership. And at some point, people look at each other and say, "Well, wait a minute. If the university is funding all of these passes anyway, and if the if the operating budget of the transit agency is 60 or 70, 80 percent coming." If the fair money of the transit agency is basically a giant university subsidy, why don't we just get rid of the fares? Right? And so you have examples of that, you know, fare-free systems that um, they just have stopped charging fares because it just wasn't worth the trouble. So, you know, there are all kinds of things that you can talk about. There are all kinds of great ferment happening. And, and by the way, living in a much bigger city, I really envy cities of your size. You've got a, you know, and, and counties of your size. You know where you know it's, you're still at a size uh, at a you know size where you know people can pick up the phone and do something and cause something to happen, and um, and where you can get a reasonable, imaginable number of people together and start to think about this. So um, let me see, sir. Yeah. Uh, do you consider zoning codes and land use policy walls around people's opportunity to access freedom? And if so, why not? talk more about SB 27 kind of stuff. Um, uh, I have talked about SB 27 because I think I've been controversial enough as it is. But, um, but absolutely, the principle is, look, we don't want to get to space. We want to get to things and people and opportunities, right? So there's that blob around your life of where you could get to in a given amount of time. There are two ways to expand those walls. One is what transportation planning does, which is to move the walls outward, and the other is to put more useful things inside the walls. And that's, that's so I can find That's good. And um, uh, so there's no question that, um, 
I mean, I think one of the great things about a place like Santa Cruz is that everyone's mind is concentrated by the sheer absence of sprawl opportunity, by, by, the, by the obvious sense that the land is full of what you can, in terms of what you can do horizontally. And you know you have to decide how your city is, you know, whether you're going to allow your city to grow vertically because there isn't any other way to grow. Um, but I think that yes, when we're talking about housing, when we're talking, for example, about you know, it is part is part of that solution. I mean, this is right. You know, part of the solution to the whole people seeking opportunity opportunity problem is to let more people live over here. Yes. And it may very well be that the more time you spend dwelling on the Aptos choke point. The more, the more that actually comes to seem like the easiest solution. Maybe it is. But the thing is, to keep everyone present in the same conversation, you know, I bring you back to the Aptos choke point because it's there. You're not going to get around it or under it or over it for any reasonable amount of money. And it really does concentrate the mind about what is actually possible. And if that means it's not going to work to have this strong commute in that direction in the future, then you know that is a that is a reality for a new conversation between the cities and the county about what development is for. Yeah. Oh, um, sure. Um, taking the consideration of the transit rail corridor, um, about over fifty percent of people live within about a mile of that corridor. Yeah. Um, what do you see as the mode of answer to get? last mile we saw to get to that quarter to use that. Do so, um, you have any suggestions? And would Metro be part of that situation? Um, or to solve that? Um, OK, let me, let me go out on a limb. Uh, I think the last mile problem is, is much overblown. Um, that's a mile. The whole thing's only two miles wide. What's the last mile? You're going to have good transit service there. You're going to, you know, you, you, we want, you, know, you want to have something good there. You want to be able to have something good. You want to be able to be within a half a mile of everything, practically, right? Where's the last mile? The last mile is a, uh, it's a deeply suburban idea, and it's a way of saying that yes, there are suburban development patterns in which large numbers of people have chosen to, to locate in ways that maroon them, make it impossible for them to walk reasonable distances in a walkable place, and therefore they have this problem called the last mile problem. You know, frankly, as an urbanist, I don't consider it my problem. <laughs> you chose to live in that situation, right? Um, and, you know, because fundamentally, you've got the geography here to have a perfectly good frequent bus network for the whole area between Santa Cruz and Capitola, uh, inclusive, that, you know, gets, gets plenty close, and then everyone can walk out. Someone want to argue with me about that? Nope. <laughs> well, no, I mean, the, yeah, the money to have to have a good enough transit system so that people will walk, but also I notice your existing density pattern, I could go back to that map, there's a lot more density there than there, too. It's actually, I'll try to go with that, someone wants to imagine. that. Um, there's, there's a, and I don't know your history enough to know if this is actually a relic of things that happened around the original line, but, uh, yeah, there it is. Yeah, quite a lot there, quite a lot in here, so I'm kind of Less than where we are. Um, can you talk more about the density? Sorry? Can you, can you talk a little bit more about our density pattern? Sure. Um, <coughs> what, do I, what, I, what I love to see as a transit planner is not just density, but continuous density in a straight line. <laughs> it will happen all the time. Um, I mean, maybe someone built up something up there and thought they were building density, and it's dense, and therefore it will all have a good bus service. Right? No, it's not, because it's not on the way to anywhere. You're not on the way to anywhere, therefore I can't combine your market with other markets and fill a bus with a diversity of people doing different things as I can when I go down some hill. Right. All kinds of different overlapping things that people are doing that cause them to all be on the same bus, which is the genius of really successful transit. And that's why there's this principle of continuity and linearity 
So this jumps out at me as a very interesting part of the rail line story, right? Mm -hmm. Is that I've got quite some strong patches of density. That, of course, is an excellent reason for transit there and an excellent reason for a good bike and bed bath there. It doesn't begin to resolve that debate. But it does say, whoa, transit really ought to be here. That regardless of what it says, regardless of what, of what the ultimate Watsonville solution is, there is a strong transit corridor there. If it is on street, what does that look like? Because presumably, if there's a bike path that transit, what if, the, you know, if that's what it is, then tra the transit's there. So what does that look like? It's another part of the conversation. Uh, Ma'am, yeah. Okay. So, to get away from this binary thing right. that you were talking about and getting to the middle ground when you consider all kinds of options, how do you facilitate that? Do you have a methodology for doing that? And because it seems to me that we've attempted to do that, but the methodology itself has constrained us. So Double that's things. basically my question. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, that's a big, hairy question of like sort of about 90% of everything I've learned in my life is in some way I could recite as an answer to that question. Um, I guess the key, I, I can talk more easily about where I think it goes wrong. Okay. The thing that I think most often goes wrong about major publicly sponsored studies of a problem <laughs> is that uh, happens at the level of scoping. Scoping? Scoping, that is, that, that's the point where you decide, okay, here's what we're going to study and here's what we're not going to study and here's how we're going to define the problem. That already leaves something important behind. <clears throat> now, um, and another thing that happens often is that studies that are ultimately meant to lead to the funding of capital projects, which is a lot of what's going on ultimately in these studies, if a study is driving toward a capital project, then the study will all be about satisfying the requirements of whatever funding source you're pursuing. And you end up something that is written to a bureaucrat instead of written to your citizens. And, the, and you're constantly telling your citizens, oh, we can't have a clear conversation with you because we have to satisfy this regulation. I see this all the time. Um, and so <clears throat> that's why what we're always trying to do is first of all, create that sort of regulation-free space, like we're in here tonight, right? We're not here to comply with any regulations tonight. We're having, you know, we're helping you have a conversation about the future of your community, about what your community is going to be like. And we, in this, when I'm running a study like this, we're really putting, we put a lot of work in protecting that space. You know, we'll take care of the compliance over here, and that'll get done, and those, and the words will get written that the funding source wants to see but they're not gonna tell us how to have a conversation. You know, the Federal Transit Administration should not be telling you what conversation you can have in your community. And that is often what I get in these big transit capital projects and the way they get scoped and the way they get that's what it starts to look. So, um, then it's just, you know, I would say, you know, our slogan is we can meet people in the presence of reality. And reality is not just bringing people around the table around the facts, which is why we so often do, you know, balance the budget yourself games, or we do little transit planning games, you know, see if you can figure out how to lay out a transit system. Do it together with these fellow citizens, you know. Touch it yourself. I'm trying to put the citizen in the position that the government agency is in so that they understand the problem that the agency is trying to solve and can understand it from their perspective, right? The other thing, of course, is maximizing the diversity of the table. You know what happens if you're ever into a conference? Everybody from a single city or a single agency goes, flies across the country to a conference, and then always sits together with the people they know from their agency. Right? So you have to always mix people up, and you know we often very manipulatively, you know, maximize the, the, the opportunities for people to show up at a table, you know, between the different parts of the table. All that's part of it. I think I know better what not to do than what to do, but and there's a lot that can be achieved by just by just not doing the common mistakes. Um, and another interesting challenge about, for example, is that you have to accept that there's going to be spheres of influence and that there's going to be an inner sphere of influence called a stakeholder, which is somebody who's motivated to like come out here on an evening and talk about transportation when you could be, you know, about lunch about a pool or something. Um, people are motivated to do that. Then you have the problem, those are already kind of weird people, right? <laughs> those people are already, you know, not very representative of the diversity in the society. So how do we this is why we have invitational stakeholder groups, and then people get upset about they weren't invited. But there has to, we have to have that process of constructing the table 
so that the right people are at the table, right? So that even though no, you know, Spanish-speaking Latino rights advocates from Watsonville chose to come out and join us tonight, they are in fact there at the table and arrangements are made to make sure they are, and to make sure that they're represented by people who have the education and engagement necessary to, to engage with us. We have one. Oh, we want one. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I forgot you. Thank you, for, thank you so much for coming. <laughs> thank you so much for coming. I apologize. Even more important now. Um, OK, just so Jenny's not alone, I can get to Watson. <laughs> Great. <laughs> So yeah, so I, I'm sorry I don't have an easy answer to that question. It's a lot. There's a lot of pieces. Because I think we need to think about it. Yeah, so and I think that's the most important thing I'd say is don't let any government agency tell you what conversation you can have, because that's some often what goes wrong. Let the, set the conversation free outside, separate from whatever processes have to be going through. Satisfied. I was wondering if you have any city or area that's maybe your favorite that's maybe not as you feel. It's not necessarily thing right. Um, I, th I, <clears throat> I think that with a lot of, I think that every process I've been in through has had its rough spots and its difficulties. Um, I have been through, I think, um, uh, I don't want to point to any particular city. I start to think about the individual cities I've worked in. I think about all the ways that are incredibly different. I think about you know how how great and uniquely the politics played out, um, and you know things were easy or wrong for different re different reasons. I think we know the I, that's why I, I mean I'm a sort of philosophical temperament. I want to sort of stay at the principle rather than uh, rather than get you focused too much on what other cities have done. You know, in principle, you get to have your own conversation, and and the key though is to have the conversation that includes the diversity of the community and. And, and, and there's some there's some expertise about that structure. Uh, who else? Mark, you have a question. Yeah, I had uh, going way back. Um, you would, and, and I, you know, completely agree with your idea that frequency is king, and that's what we were trying to achieve. And in our community, the idea of improving the frequency of transit, if we were able to have buses running every 10 minutes or 15 minutes, there's it's in my mind, they're still stuck in the same traffic at peak travel times, and it still takes an hour and a half to get from Watsonville to Santa Cruz. Right. So, you know, how do we get from the place where frequency begins to dramatically improve congestion so that people will get on that bus yeah. and use it to affect the change, the, you know, the, the reduction in traffic demand? I'm never going to tell you that a certain amount of, tra of transit ridership will fix congestion. And I'm not going to promise you that because it will fix congestion in a way that anyone will notice. Uh, and certainly not in a way that will make the buses go faster. And the reason I'm not going to promise that is in fact the principle of induced demand. The principle of induced demand says that if something gets easy, people will do it more. So if the roads became less congested, people would drive more and the roads would become congested again. This is why the roads don't become less congested. And let, you know, the only time the point where the roads really become less congested is where there is a, a where there's just no longer demand. You get out of the city and congestion is So what transit does is <coughs> gives enough. It, it does several things. First of all, good enough transit, even stuck in traffic, is <coughs> enough better than what people's options are now that they will start to use it. You see this very commonly. I mean, Watson, the, the Watsonville distance is a very good example. That's 20 miles, right? So um, if my option is to sit in my car for an hour, rolling forward a little bit, and uh, never being able to look at my phone because I'll, we're about to roll forward another 30 feet, right? I can spend an hour doing that. Or I can spend an hour and a half on a bus reading and working. We haven't solved the congestion problem yet, the bus is still stuck in traffic, but already I've got a good proposition as long as the bus is coming close enough to win it. You know, as long as we have some frequency. So you see, I'm, I'm, I'm emphasizing all those incremental wins, right? Before you have the rail line, before you have the BRT line, whatever it is, before we've you know, built elevated structure or us or whatever it is that we might ultimately do, 
you're always looking for the incremental wins. You're never, ever just, you know, one of the, one of the worst things I see, a, 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 a transit debate will just be, oh my God, everyone's just talking about what we're going to do in 10 years and nobody's talking about what we're going to do now. Or what we can do now. And there's always something you can do now. Officer. Awesome. Referring to talk about what we can do now, what's your opinion on slashing coverage to the little swivels and doing a public-private partnership with <coughs> TNC or other buying other company and using them to sort of pick up the slack where coverage can't reach right now, creating like a catchment shift for where we can subsidize those for the people getting the bigger trains. Okay, the point Can you of, repeat the question? Please? Sure. It's, it's, it's a universal question about Sorry, I not mean to question your originality, but I'm asked something like this question <laughs> almost all the time. The um, in the context of the ridership coverage trade-off, we'd like more of this. Could we not do this and instead say we'll have a partnership with Uber or something to do something else to get people out into this area? Mm. Well, it has to be a partnership that is much cheaper for the transit agency than what they are doing now, which is running this bus. And that turns out to be pretty hard. Because operated, please remember, please remember, operating cost is mostly labor. That's why a little vehicle driving around is not that much cheaper to operate than the big bus driving around. That's why all those empty seats on the bus are not evidence of inefficiency because there's not much marginal cost to have those extra seats because the cost is in the decline. I have been at South by Southwest in Austin, surrounded by the leading lights of the tech industry and had people come up to me and explain this concept and in the middle, and at, at a pause in their, in, their, um, in their excited presentation, I've said, you know, operating cost is mostly labor. And they're going, it's amazing what people don't know. It's amazing what people haven't stopped to think about. Operating cost is mostly labor. So anything else that's going to drive somebody else driving any sort of vehicle out there, right, is also going to have an operating cost. And so it all depends on what the deal is, whether that turns out to be cheaper than what the transit agency is already doing. This is all very hot right now, and I'm fascinated by why this is so hot and why the sort of microtransit movement, you can go onto my blog and read what I've written about microtransit. Um, why this whole notion of miniaturization somehow looks, feels efficient to people. And people are talking about it as though it's efficient. It's a couple of things. One is many people just don't understand that operating cost is labor and therefore see empty seats as waste, which it is not because that's not what it costs. Mm -hmm. The other thing is that it is a, I think it's a form of nimbyism. I think that people want to believe that their communities are small and intimate and that the bigness of the bus it, I know, I know this from my years in public uh, dealing with public comment. That you know, I'm, I've been told all my career, can't we just miniaturize this somehow? Can't we chop a big bus in half and have two small buses? You know, can't we? And I tie it very much to, to a basic sort of aversion to the the big bus tells you that you're in an actual city, and not everyone wants to be in a city. There's a lot of people like that, and the service to your door thing, you know, it's a way of all, that's a way of also rejecting the suburban small situation. You live on a cul-de-sac in an unwalkable neighborhood because it's five, it's five different squiggles to walk out of your neighborhood to get to a road that you can't then cross. Of course you can service to your door if that's what you do. But I refuse to accept that we should all take that problem upon ourselves unless we actually live in that situation. So those are some of the things. Uh, sir, please. Uh, have you seen governments change land use to solve the problem? It's always going both ways. you know. One of the great early experiences, and of course we've been doing this in Portland since the 1970s when, we, when Oregon passed its land use laws that put in the strong urban growth boundaries around the city. Um, we had a marvelous study that was done back in the 80s, which was the last serious proposal for a giant, a new giant Beltline freeway around the west side of the city. Um, and um, a, a brilliant group of people um, got some funding together and basically created a new alternative outside of the alternatives analysis process that the, that the DOT was doing, that the government was doing, but complying with the same sort of processes. That basically looked at a land use alternative to this freeway. In other words, 
let us change our land use assumptions, let us put more density here and here and here in logical ways, and whoa, suddenly we, don't, we no longer need it. And, and then well, how much money have we saved from not building this freeway? Oh, okay, that means we have rail lines and stuff like that. that maybe we can save. So yeah, that's, that's, we're always trying to put transit and land use together. And you know, I've been going to conferences for 25 years listening to people talking about how we need to put transportation and land use together. If it were easy, we would have done it. It's, I, we just always have to remind ourselves, uh, because the professions are so different and they have so much rhetoric designed to protect their uh, citadel against, you know, uh, against outside poison. Um, you go to a professional conference, if you go to a professional conference and you're not part of the profession, you really hear that. You really notice yeah. all the ways the profession is sort of defined. <laughs> But land use and transportation, it's like the same action in different, it's sort of like the same idea expressed in different languages. Right? It's not even different actions. It's the same thing happening in different languages. Because all, all development is transportation demand, and all transportation demand is, is creating the opportunity to develop. Where are we? Uh, uh, more? Yeah, sure. Uh, you talked about the major challenge that we're facing being the Aptos choke point. Yeah. Uh, in your book, you talked about how a choke point can actually be a benefit to transit. Mm -hmm. um, I was wondering if you could explain that concept for the audience, and then also, do you see any way that we could use that choke point as a benefit for transit here in this community? So, the way choke points work well for transit is that if you have lots of people from lots of different directions who are being brought by any mode they're traveling to one point that they have to go through together, then it makes it easy for me as a transit planner to draw lots of different services that come to a point, connect with each other, and connect with a service that's going across the choke point. And people, and that seems less of a hassle than it would appear to be if the choke point weren't there. Because if you're driving, you have to go this way anyway. See what I mean? As opposed to what it often is like, which we're taking people over here to this transit center when they could drive over there because we need to organize them over here to get them distributed. So there is a value in putting transit centers right near choke points to distribute um, on either side. I don't think that's of much use in Aptos. I think the Aptos problem, I mean, first of all, it doesn't solve the ultimate choke point capacity problem. Right? I mean, it's great, for example, that, um, uh, you know, that you're able in the Santa Cruz bus network to bring lots of people together to put them on 17 buses over the hill. It makes the 17 buses do better. Right? And if they're just only getting people from where they run. But it doesn't solve the problem of getting less of them. So that's still an issue. Um, yeah, I don't think you have. The what? I'm all for them. Question. Repeat question. What, what's the, what are my thoughts on the employer commuter program? Um, I'm not an expert on those programs, but I'm. I'm I'm very much a supporter of the principle of employers being involved in the cost of their employees' travel, and of, and of schools being involved in the cost of their students' travel. You know, I mean, I'm one of I'm a very small employer. I have ten employees, but I, I pay for a bus pass for all the employees. Absolutely, it's what you do. Um, Let's talk tonight about um, travel. I mean, transit in, in fairly generic terms saying you want to get into technology and things like that, but there are differences in operational costs and travel time and those kinds of things. Did you want to touch on any variation in transit? I think that, um, here's, the, here's the fundamental thing. Mm -hmm. What's going to govern, thank you for asking this, what is going to govern your What is going to govern the size of that block? What is going to govern where you can get to in a given amount of time? Is the speed, frequency, and reliability of the transit service. And its capacity, you have to be able to get on. And how it fits together into a network. The transit technology is not one of those things. Transit technology, rail versus bus, is a, is, is different, is, is a choice you make that ends up 
can affect some of those things. But because of bus rapid transit, when we do bus rapid transit really well, there are now both bus and rail ways of delivering most service patterns that go into creating you know, a, a maximally efficient network. There are lots of local reasons why you choose one or the other. We choose rail, a couple reasons we choose rail. One is because you have a rail line, which is sort of the situation here. Another is um, because you need the capacity. Remember, operating cost is mostly the labor, so, the, so in high demand, the ratio of passenger space to drivers is, is critical. Right? So this is the success of BART, right? A thousand people, one driver. Uh, and of course, now we have driverless systems, maybe BART systems like BART and drivers. So, um, so those are some of the things that play into those choice. But I am always encouraging people to steer away from um, becoming advocates of a particular transportation technology. Because if you do that, you start telling us not to care about this as much anymore. Because we're focused on that. Anything else? Um, yes, yeah, sir. You mentioned uh, financing from the employer side. Um, isn't it true that uh, in Portland there's an employee tax that is uh, devoted to transit? Isn't that part of uh, what goes on in Portland? Yeah, I don't want you to end the Oregon. We have no sales tax. Right. As a result, we have apocalyptic income taxes, appalling property taxes, and payroll taxes. Um, our transit agency runs on payroll taxes. If you want a funding source that is even more volatile than sales taxes, you want payroll taxes. <laughs> Just awful. So, <laughs> but as you already mentioned, we're we're you know yeah. stuck on sales tax. So you know, look, you're going to have to go where the I, I don't want to sound like Bernie Sanders here, but you're going to have to go where the money is. The money's in property. The money's in land, isn't it? <coughs> yeah, yeah. Prop 13. Too. Well, you know, in one way or another, you know, in one in some form or another, you're going to have to go where the money is. The money is not in, you know, adding another half cent to somebody's, to the cost of some poor person's, you know, trip to Walmart. That's, there's not, there's not much money. Well, thanks very much. I hear people getting ready to go, so let's wrap it up. Happy to stick around a while we'll talk. Hey, John. Well, this is what we're